For those of you that were at the first day, we'll go down into the gymnasium, the first one. First thing I actually kind of like to set up just a little bit better. Um, great. So I, I want to just take a, a quick look at this quote. If you if you open up your folders, I know these these folders are the same exact ones from last time. Um, we had a lot of extra copies of documents. So if you have if you brought yours, feel free to bring it. But if not, or grab it, feel free. If not, just kind of utilize what you have here. So as you'll notice, there's a handout, a folder, and then a Bible. So the first document actually before we get to this quote, which is why explain how it's gonna work for those that are new. Your first set of documents should look like this. This is what was used last time. You are gonna need a document from that mystery. That's in title. Okay, so the title of that document that you're going to need is The Theology of the Body and Education of Being Human by Christopher West. Everything else you're going to need is from the second set of documents, which has the quote. Does that make sense? Okay. So the reason you're going to need that first document in the first week is because we're continuing from, from that. So I want to take a quick gander at this. That that uh, that was just an outline introduction. Um, so this should be the thing that you're looking at. The thing being. All right, well, I'm glad people could join us. So I want to take a quick look at this, this quote by John Paul II. It says, man cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. As you may have noticed, the title of our second session is the sacramentality of our bodies, our relationship with ourselves. Sacramentality, you could also call it a gift, right? So we're gonna kind of be looking at this talk tonight from a lens of being a gift of ourselves, right? Our body being a gift. So a review from last session is we kind of covered a few different things. So we covered what is theology of the body? What is the misconceptions of theology of the body? We talked about creation and we talked about love. So let's kind of break those down. So theology of the body is an anthropology for the study of human persons, cultures, behavior, development, all of those things that covers God's design for our humanity as male and female. What that means about God, what it reveals about him. So everything that is created is a something, it is revealing something about the creator. Usually, sometimes, or most of the time, when people create something, there's usually a copyright on it, and that's usually just to give credit to the creator, right? And so the natural thing for us in our creation is that it goes back to credit. Right, not ourselves. One of the misconceptions about theology of the body that I hear very, very often, and I'm sure some of us have heard as well, is that theology of the body is only sex ed for Catholics. That's a portion of it, but that's not the fullness of what it is. Really, it has to do with uh, the human person and just what that actually means. So, So this document here covers a lot more than just, you know, what, I don't know, seven weeks in high school would cover, right? The other thing we covered, which is going to be very, very important for moving forward, let's talk about signs, right? Creation is a sign of God's love. God does not need us to exist. We merely need him to exist, right? We, we kind of talked about something called the first mover, which is a philosophical term. The first mover is basically something has to create everything. So the example that we used is, you know, your parents had you and so on and so on and so on, but it all kind of starts from something. That's what we would call God, right? In a philosophical term, not, not necessarily a theological, but it carries the 
So another example that we could use as one of the activities that we did last session about a month ago, maybe five weeks ago, we spent about 15, 20 minutes in adoration in front of the Eucharist. So we just kind of prayed in front of Jesus, and that was a wonderful, wonderful thing. So if we're going to define the term sign, we could say that the, the host, the bread before it's consecrated, okay? the host specifically is something that points us to the reality beyond itself, that of the host, in some way. And it makes the transcendent, which means elevated, something that we can't really comprehend, reality to us. So if we take those words and we kind of simplify it, the host or the Eucharist points us to the reality beyond the Eucharist in some way, and it makes the reality of God, because we can't fully understand who God is, because the Eucharist is Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity, but that host does not necessarily reveal all that just in the host itself. So that, that transcendent just means something that's elevated. So that's how we could kind of look at the host being a sign. So when it comes to our bodies, again, we're a sign of the creator. You can't necessarily see God himself in us, but we are a sign of his creation. Does that kind of make sense? Okay. And then the other thing we talked about is we are created for love. Jesus asks Peter, it, it's very funny, I love reading scripture because it has such an eloquent way of its writing, but then I put myself in the perspective, and you know, when, when Jesus asks Peter three times if he loves him, and Peter says, yes, Lord, I love you, and he says, feed my sheep. Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my lambs. You know, Peter, do you love me? Yes, feed my sheep. In my head, I'm thinking by that third time, Peter, like, yes, Lord, I love you. I've said this a few times. Please stop asking that question. It's getting really on my nerves, getting really annoying. But we are created in love, right? And so Jesus is just reaffirming that we are a gift in that example specifically, because he's not just asking him, does he love, does Peter love Christ? He's giving him some instruction to go serve Peter, right? He's doing the same thing with the apostles. Go here, go there, you know, reach my name. So it's spreading that love because God is love to the world. So that's why a lot of our priests, um, you know, have do all these different ministries because they are going and spreading themselves out. That's why we also need a lot of priests because one person can't do that. All right. So that's kind of just a review from the last session. So here's what we're going to go over tonight. We're going to go over six topics, six categories. We're going to go over original solitude, original unity, original nakedness, what those actually mean. And then we're going to we're going to do those in groups. We're going to discuss those. And then we're going to talk about original man, historical man, which is us, and then eschatological man. We're going to explain what that means. We're going to do those in groups as well. Does that kind of make sense? Kind of our vision for the evening. Again, that's group one has 46 to 49, group two has 49 to 52, and then uh, group three has 58 to 55. There should be a title, uh, title of these on that, on that document that you'll read for the meeting. And it's totally okay if we don't understand any of it. That's totally fine. <laughs> um, love everything I'm hearing. As I just said, I'm kind of eavesdropping. So, you guys are picking up a lot of things, a lot of themes that I just hope to go over. So that's good. So let's kind of start with uh, group one. So you guys covered original solitude, right? Uh, this was what page here? You guys had 46 to 49 ish. So, what you guys find <clears throat> interesting, insightful, confusing, mind blowing, whatever you want to call it, and you'd like to share with I think we were kind of saying uh, there's just a couple of things that I know I spoke to you. Freedom was the thing that and freedom to choose. And then the original solitude, he defines himself going to be 
sense of guilt, right, that's going to be on us. And yeah, we can choose to lie or not to lie, but that sense of that guilt is already it's built on our heart because <clears throat> it is already told to us that it's wrong to lie. Right? I know that's a very basic example, but to, to your point, like that right and wrong has already been established. And so freedom is a gift. And I think he closes his quotes with What's the last something the last line you guys had there? Oh, uh, that Genesis tells us it's our choice, right? Christopher does a really good job of explaining freedom and all that, but at the end of the day, it is up to us, right? What else do you guys have there for original solitude? Um, I think it's Through this process, that I am realizing that I'm set apart from creation, for us to realize what this actually means. So it's not meant to be necessary. Not his final destiny. Right. Being shown these answers, realizing that he is there's something about himself that's not like the like, sense of what not being able to just don't Yeah, no, that's true. Um, just kind of going to the to the slide, we kind of um, you guys certainly hit on the point, right? Right, solitude. Adam realizes that love is his origin, his vocation, uh, love of God and love of neighbor, right? And I think that's Matthew 23, 36 through 40. Uh, Christ tells us that it's important to, to love God and to love our neighbor, right? And that's kind of this point in the original solitude, right? And this solitude also, I think it's important to know that. This sense of the original solitude is also pointed to unity with God, right? Not necessarily yet unity with another person or unity with self or unity with animals and all these other things, but it's actually infinitely unity and a call with God, right? Uh, group two, right? All right, what did you guys find with uh, original unity? Talk about how one of them, one of us brought up the fact that 
because I'm having cry about like the last one in my own flesh is my flesh. Yeah. Um, what if what if it comes out how it like really brings up the the fact that we were just made to be together. Like it's a big community and that's what we kind of talked about. Like how we just thrive in community and we have that kind of uh, so that kind of made that come out to me. Yeah, there's a at Notre Dame in the in the Basilica. There, there's a painting. Um, there's a painting in the back with with Mary and Joseph and Jesus, and they're both Mary and Joseph are just looking right at Christ. Right, um, and when we do, I think we do that in our own families too. Right, um, the boy family, of course, is the exception. But it is like with their eyes just solely being focused on Christ, being focused on God. Like no matter else, what happens in their in their situation, we kind of know this. I mean, we do know the story, right? They do go through a lot of turmoil and things, but it's, if it's if they're always focused on Christ, then then. They, they manage. Christ cares. So definitely looking at, at that as a sign, right, of, of the Holy Family is, is good. The Trinity, rather, is also better. What else? And the other thing I just brought up now I'm looking at it is I, I really like the way you said how heroes express their God is. Mm -hmm. And you just talked about how, like, in the in the movie, you learned about how it's just the union of God. There's that constant renewal of God. Yeah. I thought that was really cool how you expressed that. Here's this expression of God. For sure, yeah. It, it, it only elevates it, right? It's not, you don't compartmentalize it. You don't separate them from there. They go together and one elevates the other. <laughs> we're we're going to actually talk more about that in the third session. We're going to break this down and kind of look at What else did you all find irritating, interesting, confusing? Yeah. Okay, no, that's good. That's good. Because um, there, there is a lot there. Um, so some of the points that, that you get brought up. Uh, so in, in Genesis uh, 2.23, look at the second part. By Adam desires to love another person as himself, that you guys kind of bring up in original solitude, right? Is that after he realizes he's not equal to the animals, right? He's kind of aware of his... Voices and, the, and these things, even naming to the animals, he asks for this helper, right? And then that kind of builds this friendship. This builds the, these types of different types of love. And we're, again, we're going to get into that more. Um, also, another important thing here. So Adam is struck by uh, the beauty of Eve's body in proper order. He's not lusting after it. And, and, I, and I want to kind of clarify what we're going to define as lust. Which is having a distortion of any uh, desire. Desires are good, but having a different, having a distorted way of looking at that. So, again, going back to the line, you might think that lying to get yourself out of trouble because being in trouble is not a good thing, right? So, your way of instead of not doing the thing is do the thing and then lie and cover it up. So, there is a distorted view of the desire of not being right so that's kind of how we're going to define lust it's not just in this sexual or erotic view it's, it's more or less as you know we, we, we can all lust after different things like money or work even right uh, whatever the case is um so yeah then I, I just want to be very clear of that's how we're defining lust we're not going to look at it just for one thin line that's really important in the next session as well. Were you guys the group that brought up flesh is my flesh? Love of my bones or was that you? That was you guys. Okay. So uh, it's it's important to note, and, and he says it in the document. I know you guys saw it, they, they didn't see it. But in the Jewish tradition, what that's really defining is when you use the 
terms bones and flesh. What you're actually saying is that's somewhat. It's not a body, but it's somewhat. Gloves going down this tangent, down this conversation all the time about how it's somebody and not a body. I'm just going to kind of leave it at that right now. But what is being said there is Adam is seeing that he is word love in proper order, right? And, and by that, basically, what I'm saying is not to use the other person. Does that make sense? Okay. So in original unity, each of them, Adam and Eve, man, right, is creating God's image and likeness. That was another point that we just really pushed last session. So this kind of comes full circle. And so in that unity, they realize that they're both creating God's image and likeness. So they are both worthy of love, but they're also both as individuals, but together, also, again, separate from the end. So they're both this freedom of solitude, as well as this unity, and I think somewhere we're not, I, I know somewhere in here, you guys mentioned it. Oh, uh, page 49, the last two lines. Uh, the experience of unity overcomes man's solitude in the sense of being alone without the other, right? So it's important to elevate that solitude with community. So the church fathers are very interesting to read, and one of them mentions how. You know, we have permits uh, in, in, in the faith. And all of them agree that you need to learn to live in community before you can go live in solitude. Because if you don't know how to live with community, you don't know how to live with other people, you're probably not going to be able to know how to just live with yourself. Like, that's just the reality. Right. And then, of course, again, you're Does that part kind of make sense a little bit? I know there's, there's a, a lot for that section. Any questions from another group on that section? Okay. We'll go to uh, group three. You guys had original nakedness, right? Okay. What did you find? Remind me of the pages you guys are on. 15. Great. Thank you. All right. What did you guys find uh, to be insightful? Or have questions though. Yeah, definitely. This this is a good point. Kind of going back on the guilt thing, right? This guilt can very easily lead down to this road of shame. And so if you want to, I think this part is important to separate. So guilt in itself, if it's ordered properly, can be a good thing. It's an indication that you did something wrong and that you should not do it again. Shame, typically as we understand it, right, to your point, it could I have a hard time believing that this was ever a reality or a possible reality. Shame tends to be one of those things that you make a mistake and then you just beat yourself up over and over and over again and then you just, you know, it's a cycle. Uh, that, again, is a distorted way of fixing the original problem, right? Which is, I we really should stop with I made a mistake, forgive myself, I'm going to probably feel like it, whatever it is, and then kind of let it go and move on. Right, that shame kind of comes into that point, but to the other yeah. point, like, different, you yeah. guys want like guilt, yeah, I need to do something, right? Yeah, yeah, so definitely with 
the shame here. It's 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 just something because of you know original sin and the fall, really, that that is just a natural thing that carries. But I, I do like your point of it being a redeeming factor as well, right? Of knowing instinctively, even though it's again disordered or, or mis misordered or whatever you want to call it. It's really a sign of I should not be mistreated, and I deserve love of God and by other people, even if we don't know how to express it. So yeah, there's definitely a redeeming quality, and I love that John Paul. I mean, Christopher brings it up, but JP two goes into the whole thing of it, um, which that would be a conversation with them. So I'm really glad you picked up on. What else do you guys have? Talk about that it was hard to talk about. Yep. <laughs> um, also, here in the beginning, it says, But how can we understand nakedness without shame when we have inherited the fig leaves and have no direct experience of it? Uh, so it talks about a couple passages in Tobit where it talks about. Uh, since the first man and woman were fully inflated with God's love, they were entirely free to be a gift to one another. They were free with the very freedom of the gift, as John Paul II puts it. So you go, oh, that's theology of thought, that's not Tobit. <laughs> so actually, it's funny you bring up Tobit, though, because we are going to, when we talk about marriage and that relationship and friendship in the next session, we are going to bring up Tobit. So, Yeah, the, the human body within itself is a gift, right? Like, just in, in, in everything that you could possibly imagine, right? Our, our food is a gift to take care of our body. Our body is a gift to supply other things to other people, right? Um, so, for example, with, with work, we, most we need our bodies to work, to go work, supply money supply support for our friends, our family, ourselves, those types of things. But everything, you know, you can kind of look at it from that lens as a gift rather than looking at it as an inconvenience or a burden for honestly for us probably nothing. Uh, then then it kind of it gives a lighter perspective to whatever the situation is. This, have anything else because it, it is a tough area to talk about, so we can kind of move on if you um, but, but one thing, just going back, is that the key to understand God's plan for human life when we talk about the original, this original, some of the original, uh, you know, unity is life without shame, but it's this weird concept because we haven't, we've never experienced it. The body reveals the person, again, somebody, right? If you kids, remember, if you see quality and you think of their name, you're going to picture an image in your mind. It's going to be of the person's face. It's going to be an image of the person's body or whatever. So the body reveals the person. The body, again, is. Does that make sense? Okay. So does anybody have any questions on any of the three topics we just covered? If we're gonna we're gonna move on to the other three subjects, and we, we can stay in these groups. Okay. Um, at this point, you're gonna need from your first uh, packet the theology of the body and education and being human. So if you guys need the restroom, uh, restrooms up here or up here, if you go right, it's a 
Oh, is it? Is it in the second one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Some of you, for some of you, it might it might be in the first, it might be in the second. So, I guess I've made more copies since we doubled in the registration. Okay. Yeah. So it, it should look like this. It's another document by Christopher Rex. This is a, these are going to be a shorter reads. All right. So group, group one will we'll keep the numbers as, as they were. Um, you guys are going to cover original math. Okay. An education being human, that takes two. And then historical man will be group two. That's also page two. And then group three, that's eschatological education being human. That's going to be page three. So we got the, uh, another 10 minutes to read and, and discuss, and then we'll kind of come back. All right, guys, we're going we're gonna to kind of come back in to uh, into the group. All right. So, all right, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna go in the same order again. We're gonna do a repeat. So, original man, what did you what did you guys find interesting about this reading? So then you might kind of finally heard my work. So how did you know that she was the person uh, in the department? And to me, that's like, oh, no, we're not supposed to do that. Like, no, 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 we're not, that's not supposed, we're not supposed to do that. And we were fighting against that stuff. And some of the things I do is that I think, especially for like, if I'm not supposed to do that now, that you can have that So much anguish about having all those worries about making all these options. What else do you guys find? Thank you. 
their house they get it they're just kind of like oh, you know there's like no shame they're, they're just kind of like free villains you know yeah and it's just like that's not like a good visual To read, to read that the same principle as you, if we has a quote about basically keeping the faith childlike, not childish, because there's a big difference. But that childlike visual they can mention there's just like there's innocence there. There's no thought for a second about the situation. So I think a lot of that is that's a good way to put it. Yeah, so I mean, original man, you know, their desires are in order, their friendships are like desires, all of these things. And man is fully aware of his own actions. Created for a union, again, back to this. Uh, this is at last a vote on my bone, but it's your flesh. It's for this reason that a man clings to his wife, be one flesh, right? He is also created for holiness, which we are going to get to. Uh, to love as God loves, and to see as God sees. There's a there's a song that we're going to listen to in the last session. Um, there's a song called Give Me Your Eyes. Has anybody heard that song? Before? Yeah. Okay. So there's a particular scene in there that I think is very, very important. Um, and I'll just kind of bring it up. I'm sure we're going to talk about it. Um, the man singing is basically, it's a song of prayer asking God to give him the ability to see as God sees. And there's one particular one instance where the man sees another gentleman in a suit at a train station. He's lost his job, and the guy is like frantic, does not want to go home, embarrassed, shameful, does not want to look wife, does not want to his kid. And instead of the man, the, the singer, Instead of him judging or walking by this man or really just ignoring it, he asks God in that moment to give him his eyes to see as God sees this man. And, and I think that's a very good visual. And again, I want to come back to this point in the next session. So we are going to start with that. And there's like three or four examples of this, but I think that's a very good book. I think it's the first one, seventh or eighth grade. I've only heard, I only saw the video once, but years later or so sick of me. So I think it probably did something. I would like to think. Um great. So what about historical man? What did you guys find? Sure. Quite a few things yep. that I think the one that really jumped was the um the Christ guy right that was Big phrase of JP too. <laughs> and I, I want to make note the next the, the next few words are as John Paul expresses. <laughs> right. Um, so basically, um, so concupiscence is our inclination to sin. We are attracted to sin. We're inclined to sin as a actually really going back to that lying example, lying to get ourselves out of trouble. Uh, okay. So they effectively liberate or liberty from the domination of so one thing is if Christ died on the cross it is to liberate us from sin in general okay uh, our slavery to it and all these things sin on the other hand liberates 
doing a play on words basically here. So there's another line in the book right before that. Um, our liberty is our freedom. And so sin is trying to bring down our freedom or our liberty towards God. Um, and then on the other hand, Christ dies on the cross for us to liberate us from that sin or inclination to sin. Does that kind of help a little bit? Okay, I know it's I know it's a it's a, it's a big detail, but it's also a, uh, something that can kind of go a little bit over. Um, yeah, I, I hope that helps a little bit. So does that maybe put some other stuff in perspective that you guys found in the in the paragraph or a couple paragraphs? Yeah. Um, so God's love again is genuine. Um, so God is um it was on a previous one. So uh God does love us. Right? Uh, have you ever read the Song of Songs? Okay, so if you've read the Song of Songs, the Song of Songs is a, it is essentially a poem. When we read scripture, this is another important point. You don't read it necessarily from front to back, like you would just read a regular book. You need to read it like it's a library. Like there's poetry and there's history and then there's, um, I say history and then like the testament. New Testament would be, yes, history, but at the same time it's like present. Uh, by looking at Christ's example, that type of thing. Um, so if you're going reading that, Song of Songs is a poem about God, God expressing his love for the chosen people, the, uh, the Jewish people. Right, from Jerusalem. But it's not expressed in that way. It's expressed as a man loving a woman. So that that is, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm, I'm guessing that's probably where he's starting to pull those lines from because he does write a lot about Song of Songs in the text of the audience. So God is a lover who does love. Obviously, he would love the movie physical way in which people do. But it's expressed in that way for us to understand in the Song of Songs, which is probably grabbing from your from raising back to you. Um, but the confusing part is that he's using the word from the Song of Songs and then he's throwing God's love in there rather than human. Because there are definitely other Does that kind of make sense a little bit? Does that help? Okay. Is there anything else? On that sin is, when we go to confession, a lot of us have a tendency of a sin, or whatever it is, uh, that we tend to repeat in confession, right? Whether that's lying or lust or whatever the case is. Every time we go to confession, it, we are essentially allowing the Holy Spirit or, and Christ to breathe within us to alleviate, not alleviate this, to get rid of that sin, right? And so staying near the sacrament being sacramental people, sacramentality of the body, right, being this sign, allows that sin to dissipate. I, I can tell you in my own experience that when I was 15 or 16, I think I hadn't been to confession in maybe like four or five years. I had been receiving communion in that time, and I had, I had legitimately forgot that confession was a thing because growing up, I didn't really go to confession on a regular basis. I went to mass every week, overserved, all those things.
but confession was not necessarily a high priority in my family. And so I genuinely was struggling with stuff at that time, but I honestly forgot about confession. I remember talking to our chaplain about it. He's like, when's the last time you went to confession, Bill? I was like, early middle school, maybe late elementary school. He's like, oh, let's, yeah, let's go to confession and do that. Um, and I can tell you from that point, I think I was 17 at that time. Yeah, I was 17. And from that point, over the course of seven or eight years, I've seen that, smooth, you know, I've seen certain sins kind of dissipate over time. Um, and I'm much happier with that. And, and, and I, I attest that to God and I attest that to the Holy Spirit in this example of you, you stay by the sacraments, you know, you allow God to heal you. And you have to put yourself in a position of willingness to do that, whatever that looks like. It, it's going to be different for everybody. To do the day, right? That really helps by like, keeping yourself near the sacraments. So that's that's Eucharist, that's confession, adoration, that's all of it. So I'm not sure if Eucharist could say something about that. It's very good, you know, we're around that. Okay. Um, yeah. 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 Uh, we first needed to kind of define what eschaton was. Not all of us, but some of us uh, needed to know that eschaton was like the final days, yeah. like our final resting place like in heaven. Because uh, it said at the beginning, what about the experience of embodiment and our longing for the union in the eschaton? So that was referring to like what's going to happen to our marriage in heaven. Yeah. Uh, it says there will be no longer given in marriage at the resurrection. Are you longing for union will be done away with, but no, it will be fulfilled. Sacraments are merely earthly signs of heaven realities. Yes. No longer need a sign of witness to heaven of the first marriage. Yep. Yeah. Like it kind of sort of explains that like it, you know, it kind of goes full circle. But there's like the original So, because we, we can't 
lots of great hosts, right? So there is a higher location there. And so that is one of the ways in which we could maybe understand it as part of what you said, kind of understanding the merit piece, uh, that the priest is married to the church, therefore in persona Christi, in the person of Christ, being married to the church as Christ in heaven would be married to Jesus. And in both of those, there is no need for marriage in the way in which we understand it. And also, there's no reason for the sexual union in which we understand it in heaven. Does that kind of make sense? That's one of the ways in which we can kind of say we understand, you know, priests are married to the church. It's not necessarily the best phrasing, but it's one of the phrases of the church. It also says something to be So we're there? Yeah, so we're yeah. yeah. This whole journey, guys, towards God, we're not going to understand a lot. Uh, this is meant for faith. You have to trust that the Lord is moving, right? It, it's, and mentioned of sticking to the, the sacraments, right? Um, we're allowing the Lord to breathe within. Within That's one of the ways in which you can trust him. It, it, it's not waking up every day and saying, you know, I mean, most days, honestly, really, it's, it's the Lord's probably dragging a lot of us kicking and screaming, right? Like, I do this again. But it's trusting him that he's put you in the right position, right? Some days there's two ways, and that's where consolation comes in. Right, consolation is, is the Lord expressing some sign to you. Like, I think a week before coming down, uh, a week before, two weeks before coming down to Houston, I got a email from a former student of mine who was going for his Eagle Scout project and having his court of honor. And from something that I said four years previously, hadn't heard from him, he had mentioned to me that something really made an impact. And so he decided to mimic the Eagle project that I did. Did not need to know any of that. I was flabbergasted. I remember who the kid was. Apparently, he had one of my undergrad fitness cards. That was weird. But regardless, um, that was a consolation for me of saying, okay, my time in that parish that I was serving for three years was worth the time. Um, I also kind of like calling that the Moses effect, right? We don't necessarily understand everything that we do. And God told Moses, you're going to lead them to the promised land. What happens when he leads them to the promised land? He can't go in. He's done all this work, and he's just looking at it like, oh, I can see it. Oh, that looks nice. Where can I go in? Nope. Okay, I got to trust. Like, that's that's the thing. And then Joshua has to lead them into the promised land. He leads them to it. Joshua leads them to it. So that's just a few things to think of. Does anybody have any questions about that? So, preparing for our final session, uh, which we're going to have on May 20th, that's Monday, that's four Mondays from now, I think that's four weeks. Uh, love and responsibility, we're going to talk about three types of friendships. We're going to talk about also men, women, and the mystery of love, which is chapter one. That's your third packet in the, in the folder. Uh, that should look like this, and then there should be one short gift document uh, behind it. That's what we're going to kind of be looking at. Again, as I said at the last one, don't feel don't feel the need that you got to read it beforehand. We're going to do the same type of thing. But it, it's good to just maybe go over it a little bit ahead just so you have an idea. But this is, out of these talks, the, this is the talk that I think most people get excited about because we break down the different types of love, we talk about the different types of friendships from the lens that we've already kind of up there, right? I, as much as I would love to start with that talk, because I would, we have to kind of lay down the groundwork to get there. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, great. So yeah, again, 7 to 8, 30. The name of the Father, the Son, the Spirit. Holy Spirit. Our hearts to you over mine. Have fruitful discussions 
he allowed us to take away something from this evening. He wants to remember it and reflect on it and pray over the next month. We ask this in the intercession of Jesus, you and our lady as we pray. Hail Mary. Lord, Lord grace, Lord is to speak. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Jesus, you pray for us. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. 